Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Comics Coffee Metal Podcast. I'm your host, Don Cardenas. So when I had first started doing this podcast again and uh, earlier this year, I was intending to alternate the interview episodes with, you know, uh, some other episodes where I would talk about comics I'm enjoying and uh, music I'm enjoying, make some recommendations, maybe have a little, you know, I guess, you know, ramble (laughs) about a certain topic or something that was on my mind. And as much as I enjoyed doing those, they ended up being a lot more, a lot more work <laughs> than I intended them to be. And I, you know, just kind of let that fall by the wayside a bit. I was really starting to miss doing that. But ultimately, I don't, right now, I don't have the time to like bring that back as its own separate concept. So I'm going to try something different. Uh, I'm going to instead put some recommendations in front of this episode. Uh, and you know, talk about a few things I've been enjoying, kind of you know put out a little more positivity and everything. And before we get to our guest, Nelson Blake, who is great by the way, and I can't wait for you guys to hear this discussion. I'm going to talk about some music and a comic or two I'm enjoying, and kind of just putting that out there. And hopefully, uh, hopefully it works. We'll see. Who knows? It was uh, also brought to my attention that uh, though I do discuss the things I'm working on with the guests during the podcast that, you know, a few people have messaged me who do listen to the podcast uh, that maybe I should talk about the things I'm working on more, kind of put that out there a little bit. So I don't have anything super uh, prescient right now to discuss. I did recently have a short and a uh, successful Kickstarter called uh, Nightmare Theater. I had a six page short story called Dinner with Blobby that uh, is my second collaboration with this writer, uh, Philip Butehorn who's a really great writer and I, I really like his sensibilities. And that was just kickstarted and funded and I'm sure once, I think in the beginning of this year, next year, that, the beginning of this year, uh, it's, it's the end of the year, thankfully, <laughs> but so fried. Uh, so beginning of the, you know next year, 2021, I think it's gonna be put out for everybody digitally or I don't know if there's gonna be uh, print copies available, but I'll be sure to toot that horn when it comes to it. I've also been doing some coloring work, which is new for me. And it's been really interesting just coloring other artists that are not myself. It's a lot of fun, first of all. But it's, you know, I'm also kind of learning a lot in terms of just seeing how people approach stories differently and how I might have done something differently if I was the line artist for that, but not necessarily would have been better. But it's just been kind of seeing a more in-depth uh, you know, alternative or just kind of, you know, spending more time with someone's pages than I normally would. But both those projects that I've been coloring, those are not announced yet. Um, one's for uh, an anthology and another one is going to be kickstarted in January and I will also be having the creators of that on the show. There's some longtime buddies of mine and I, you know, they're going to come on the show anyway, so you know, it's kind of neat that they'll be coming on the show to promote something that I'm also working on them with. So that'll be fun. I know I've brought up my comic emissary a whole bunch in the podcast because that was kind of my main focus at the beginning of this year. And I've been trying to get back to it in, in between doing short stories for other writers and stuff like that. But it's been uh, it's been difficult because I, I launched it on a Patreon and I've kind of realized that that's, that format's not for me that kind of setup is not for me so I'm probably going to be shut you know it's I've had it pretty much shut down anyway but I'm probably just going to delete it altogether and just you know focus on working on the you know emissary until it's finished and then maybe launching a kickstarter or just like a general pre-order and uh, you know self-printing it and stuff like that so you know I'm still going to be bringing it up mentioning on the podcast and all that and I'm still working on songs for it but as of right now, I think the best thing is just kind of, you know, just letting it get done <laughs> at its own pace. And I'm not trying to rush it. I want I want to take my time with it because it's it's an important story for me. And you know, I'm I really kind of want to savor it and make it the best I possibly can, both the art and the music. Also, on the subject of Patreon, uh, this isn't Patreon, but 
I've started a, a coffee or Kofi, uh, co ko fi for the podcast. Um, it's not going to be anything other than, you know, just a tip jar I'm leaving out for everybody. So if you enjoyed the podcast and, you know, you want to toss a buck or something my way or, you know, buy me a coffee, <laughs> as it says on there, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. You know, any... You know, I, I'm not expecting, like, you know, <laughs> any serious money from this or anything like that. But anything I do get, it, I do plan on reinvesting into the podcast, be it getting better equipment or finding, you know, maybe even like paying for some promotion here or there. If that's a thing to do, I don't know. <laughs> but it's not necessarily anything for me to really profit off from. You know, I love doing this podcast and I'm perfectly fine doing it for free. But... You know, if there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a cash here and there to kind of, you know, get it out to more people, make it make it a little bit bigger than it is. I'm, you know, I'm not going to shy away from that either. One of the neat things also about doing the uh, coffee or Kofi or I'm going to say coffee because <laughs> it because their tagline is, you know, buy me a coffee or whatever. Um, they, they have a shop option. And for my art, I haven't had a shop open for a while. I've been kind of figuring out where I want to do it because I used to have one with Store Envy and it was fine, but uploading to it was just like, it wasn't, you know, very user friendly, I think. You had a lot of options and stuff like that, so I guess it was good in that way, but in terms of like quickly loading up a, f a bunch of products and something like that, it was not working. But, you know, with coffee, I can, you know, have a, a store there. And th this would be strictly focused for the podcast, so if in the future I do have any podcast merch or type of things, I could, I could just plant it there. So that's also kind of neat for that, too. I do have stickers for the podcast, but, you know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not assuming that there's, like, any sort of demand aside from, oh, hey, that's neat <laughs> for the sticker. Like, I don't think there's going to be, you know, I'm not going to, like, pre-order a whole bunch of t-shirts or anything crazy like that but you know it's nice to have that option if it ever comes to that okay enough rambling let's get to the recommendations the first thing I want to recommend is a graphic novel called happiness will follow it's by uh, artist and writer Mike Hawthorne and you might recognize that name he's been all over Marvel Comics the past few years he's a utterly fantastic artist and as it turns out a really strong and great writer as well this is an autobiography of his life, and it's really compelling and moving and just brutal, <laughs> And but it's also you know, beautifully illustrated. Mike doesn't, he, he adopts a slightly different style than his normal comic superhero style. And while it still looks like him, it's much more stripped back, and that really benefits the, the story and the, and the subject matter. And there's not like this excessive, well not that he has excessive amount, he's Again, he's one of my favorite artists, but there's not, you know, a ton of like cross hatching or, you know, the usual comic <laughs> artist, you know, uh, staples that we have in our styles and stuff like that, especially with superhero comics. But, you know, the uh, description <laughs> from Amazon is Eisner Award nominated artist Mike Hawthorne presents a true and tragic graphic novel memoir about family, abuse, survival, and what it means to be Puerto Rican in America. And that, that, that's, that's a pretty fair uh, fair and succinct description of the book. I mean, it, there's tons of stuff in there about Mike's childhood and growing up and the tumultuous relationship he has with his mother and just with, you know, li <laughs> with the way life goes in general. And it's, again, it's beautifully drawn, beautifully written. If you like any type of biographies or uh, memoirs and stuff like that, novel or graphic novel, I cannot recommend this enough. This was really a truly, truly like stunning piece of work. It's it would be a great gift, <laughs> to be honest, for someone who who likes this kind of stuff. You know, if you have someone in your family who likes novels and memoirs and stuff like that, and I would really recommend this. And that's why I'm bringing it up again. You know, for a Christmas present or holiday present for somebody who, you know, might be flirting with the idea of getting into comics and. They like this kind of stuff or if you like comics yourself it's a well really really nice hardcover it's under 20 bucks which you know you can't beat a hardcover under 20 bucks so happiness will follow mike hawthorne 
highly recommend it. The next thing I want to recommend is some music. So there's this band called Evergrey. They're a Swedish progressive metal band and that sounds very <laughs> Swedish progressive metal band. It, it, it can sound like very off-putting, kind of like when I was describing Happiness Will Follow just recently that, you know, something, you know, tragic or heartbreaking or just, you know, someone dealing with a lot of difficulties. Like it sounds like, oh man, that's kind of intense. <laughs> so Swedish progressive metal sounds intense, but it's not. It's, um, it's, uh, it's really, really well done. Uh, Evergrey is a band that I've kind of come across, I think former guest and comic shop owner Patrick Brower recommended them to me, but I could be mistaken. I'm not entirely sure, but I've, I've become aware of them the past couple years and they've rapidly become one of my, you know, favorite bands to listen to. They have a real na uh, knack for, it's like, not having stuff that's inaccessible. The main guitarist and vocalist, uh, Tom Englund, he, you know, has a really great tenor voice. It's not this like super high falsetto-y power metal type thing. Uh, he he knows when to pull it in. He knows when to go for it. And on top of that, this band's not afraid to use electronic sounds and since not anything overpowering. It's very much in support of the guitars and the drums and the bass but they're not afraid to let that come through or have those kind of sections be integral parts of, of the song. And, you know, on top of <laughs> on top of all that, they have these, this like weird dichotomy of having like these nice synth sounds and, and pianos and stuff like that and this really great singer. And then they have these really just nasty, low tuned, just heavy as hell riffs. And, you know, on top of like blistering guitar solos and, it's just really, really kind of like epic stuff, but Tom Englund's lyrics is, ver are, they're very, they're mostly positive, which is, which is nice. But they're also like very personal and introspective and there's, there's a lot of great melody there. So this is kind of a band that's like taking <laughs> a lot of things that I like and, and just like doing it to the max and I, I'm really digging it. I've been a fan of theirs for, I want to say at least four years now. Uh, the first album of theirs that I listened to and I think just I still listen to is called The Storm Within and I think that's like their fifth or sixth album too. I I have not gone back that far in this band yet to listen to that stuff just because when I want to listen to Evergrey I'm still stuck on that album. And their uh, most recent album after that was The Atlantic which is also excellent. I do prefer The Storm Within but The Atlantic is still really good. But the reason I'm, I'm being uh, rambly and talking about them right now is they have a new album on the horizon called Escape of the Phoenix. It's uh, due out February 2021 and they have released their new single. And I am stoked for it. It is very, very good. It's called Forever Outsider. Um, and it has all those things I, I just mentioned, like great melodies, big thick riffs, uh, some really great electronic uh, composing parts and just fantastic lyrics and it's something that you know it, it's a nice breath <laughs> of fresh air because a lot of metal you know is like an airing of grievances <laughs> type of situation and these guys they, they're more like you know while they definitely have times they can do that it's just more introspective and personal and that's you know when you when you pair that with the type of actual instrumental music they're making it's it's great and it's it's really refreshing and it's it's different so i'm going to put a clip of forever outsider in right now to give you a taste and it, again it's something that you know i hope you all dig because this band is probably one of those bands that is going to stick with me for a very long time
Okay, so the next and last recommendation I have before we get to the interview is uh, another music recommendation. This is the latest single from Ola England. Uh, I, actually, I think it's pronounced Ula England, but he says Ola because that's what everyone says. Uh, he's a very popular YouTube uh, personality, I guess, <laughs> uh, musician. He, he's accomplished in his own right. He played, you know, he's played with Six Feet Under. He's played uh, with, he plays with the band The Haunted, his own project Feared. He owns Solar Guitars, which is a rapidly growing and very popular metal guitar style company. And uh, he's, he's put in the work, <laughs> but he's also a very talented musician. He's one of my favorite YouTube channels to watch. Um, he's also Swedish, <laughs> uh, uh, going with a theme today here with the Swedes. So, you know, he released uh, a solo album earlier this year called Master of the Universe, an instrumental solo album. And it was neat because he incorporated a lot of different influences, a lot of different genres into something that's very much a metal instrumental album. But with metal, you can kind of take some left turns here or there and it still sounds all right it still sounds good it still sounds cohesive and so he's back again <laughs> he's got a new uh instrumental album on the horizon as well called starzinger and the first single off of that is called stars and ponies and he's adding even more elements now this single starts off with like a total 80s style uh, John Carpenter-esque synth line and goes into some just really great guitar riffs and work and just it's a very heavy and a mellow and just all kind of all, all that kind of stuff when I listen to instrumental metal like I have like having those big hills and valleys and different influences come in because if you're not including vocals or you know and having that kind of being a driving aspect of the song you need to it's rare like that just a riff or something and you're just playing it the normal amount of times or whatever that that becomes something really listenable as instrumental so you know incorporating all these different styles and genre influences to his music it's it's been really cool seeing someone whose band work is very groove metal death metal you know almost percussive riff based kind of stuff and then this stuff's like you know out of left field by comparing comparison to that he's a an amazing guitar player he's not well he's more than capable of shredding and and you know putting a lot of people to shame he's very much melodic in terms of what he does for solos and things like that and as much as i can respect these instrumental guitar players who just you know know the fretboard up and down and do these massive sweet picking arpeggios and crazy tapping licks and all these things. Um, I'm more of a attracted to a melody, uh, and <laughs> um, I'm chuckling because my wife's name is Melody. So of course I'm attracted to a melody. Uh, so you know, this in in terms of guitar work, you know, and solos, I prefer melodies, which is you know probably why I prefer Kirk Hammett to you know, Dave Mustaine. I don't know. So that's just, you know, my preference, but, you know, I think it, it serves this type of music very well. And, and, and I'm not saying like Joe Satriani or Steve Vai, like those, those guys don't have melodies. They got, they got melodies for days. I'm, it's, it's all the stuff in between too. So, you know, Ola's got, Ola cites a lot of the similar influences that I would, I would consider myself having when it comes to music. And so it's kind of, you know, really up my alley to, to, to listen to stuff from someone who has those influences and is far more talented than I am and is able to, like, put them together in the right way and just create some really cool stuff. So I, I do highly recommend you go check out Master of the Universe. It's Ola England. Um, and I just realized that Evergrey, Evergrey's front man is also named England, but there's no relation there. Um... But they're both Swedes, so again, I guess we got a theme today. I don't know. <laughs> but I highly ch check that out because, you know, it's available everywhere. I think he's even have it streaming on YouTube. It's on Apple, Spotify, all that good stuff. But what I'm going to play right now is a clip from that first single, Stars and Ponies.
All right, now that I got all that out of my system, let's talk about my guest. My guest is a fantastic artist who I've been, you know, watching for a, a good while. His art styles is his art styles are varied. He can switch it up. He can, you know, do real big superhero stuff. He can do more animated type stuff. He's just a stellar artist and also a big metalhead. And I've been wanting to talk to him forever. He's worked for Marvel, Top Cow, DC. Uh, just he's worked on such a wide range of genres of books. And his latest book is something new he's managed not to have done yet. And that's an all ages book from the new publisher, AWA. And the, the timing of that is, is coming out now is just happenstance, to be honest, because I, I wanted to talk to him regardless because he has a lot of great knowledge and a lot of great points of view about metal and learning guitar and learning art and stuff like that. So without further ado, here's my guest, Nelson Blake. Okay, Nelson, uh, I'm incredibly stoked to have you on the podcast today, and there's a ton of stuff I want to talk to you about and ask you about, but first and foremost, I have to ask you the crucial three questions of life. Comics, coffee, metal, what are you digging right now? All right, so I'm going to start with coffee, because that's the shortest one to answer. Um, right now, the only coffee I drink is the Javalia coffee, um, that brand of coffee, and the way I take it, because I've been doing keto for several years, is I take it with butter, turmeric, um, sometimes red pepper, cinnamon, and nutmeg. And I, I, I stir that with a frother, and I love it. Love it to death. That, sound, that sounds pretty tasty. It's fantastic. It's, it, if you've ever been to Starbucks um, and had a flat white, it tastes kind of like that, or like a blonde espresso. It was kind of in that okay. vibe. Uh, like somewhere between a flat white and a blonde, blonde espresso. But yeah, it's it's for me, it's the best tasting like over-the-counter coffee. And if I can't mm -hmm. get that, I'll get the Italian um, St Starbucks brew. But outside okay. of that, I'm generally slumming it. I don't really like any <laughs> other coffee. If, I can definitely feel that I'm, you know, making do. And as oh. you can tell, for an over-the-counter guy, I'm, I'm as snobby as you get before you start getting a French press. <laughs> uh actually my wife and i we you know before we s recently switched um we were all javalia that was our that was like really we, we were we were testing out different brands and doing all this stuff. and you know some brands are fine or you know like caribou or something like that they're acceptable like whatever's on sale but typically javalia you know you know we're parents so we're always in target for some god awful reason um so there's usually on sale at target so it's like all right we'll get we'll pick up a bag here a bag there um but i recently switched to uh a little bit more expensive coffee um from uh my previous guest <laughs> who's a comic writer musician and now coffee roaster we switched to rootless coffee and it's incredible but you know if you know for some reason we stop drinking that i would go back to javalia because it's i don't know i've i've we've tried plenty of brands i've tried other premium more expensive brands because mm -hmm. your value is kind of like in that middle where it's like yeah it's not it's not maxwell house but it's not like a local roaster that's twice as much per bag you know right so and the, no, right right between 20 bucks a, a bag and you know um five bucks a bag <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i i have this distinct memory that uh I forget, uh, I think it was way back, many years ago, not many years ago, like three years ago, my daughter's, uh, at my daughter's baptism, I was just picking up some coffee for everybody for the party, and I went to Target, and they had like, uh, I was like four fifty a bag for the Javalia mm -hmm. on sale, and there was like no limit, so I was like, I walked out with like seven bags. That's how we do like, it. My wife's like, why did you buy all this? I'm like, it was, it's like $3 off our normal price. You know, I'm like, that's why we're not allowed to go to Costco because I would just do shit like that all the time. <laughs> hey, you did the right thing, man. I mean, that's how we are over here. We have a CVS that sometimes sells Javalia for five bucks a bag, and okay. usually it's 10 bucks a bag everywhere. Uh, oh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and when that happens, we, we jump on it and we just grab them, grab them. Yeah, good, good. Um, the, 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 uh, the, you mentioned the keto thing, and I, I recall you, you know, mentioning that on, on Twitter and all that occasionally. And that always struck me as kind of just, odd for like the butter aspect of it mm -hmm. um and at first time i heard of it i was 
extremely skeptical of like is it any good like that just seems really this seems like something you would tell someone is a thing that but you're really just messing with them yeah um but you know then you start adding in like oh yeah and cinnamon and some turmeric i'm like this is this is sound like a pretty (laughs) pretty tasty (laughs) treat i am definitely not keto at all um there's some of the things you gotta you you do with keto that i'm like i can't give that up (laughs) i'm Uh not in that mental space to do um Though uh, I, I respect those who can stick with, you know, stick with that and all that. And if it works for you, beautiful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I might have to give, I might have to go and give that a shot. Cause you, you know, that's no sugar, right? Yes. No sugar. So the key with it is you can go high fat in your diet and not have any of the like artery cholesterol issues. If basically you do two things. One, you want to take in good fats, right? So not mm-hmm. like crazy, disgusting fast food type fats or no. canola oil and stuff like that. Um, so you're taking in, you know, more coconut oil, avocado. And when I say butter, not margarine, but like real butter. So mm-hmm. that's number one. And number two is whenever you're taking in fat, you got to greatly reduce how much sugar you're taking in. Because the issue is that sh- sugar and fat and salt, they don't like each other. Fat and salt are fine but when you bring in the sugar that's when you get the plaque in your arteries and stuff like that Mm, so a lot of the information about fat is really um skewed improperly because it's with a lot of sugar in the diet it's not with a very low sugar diet so that's that's the key with that and with and i'll give people people listening to this and they want to do the coffee thing the frother is the magic ingredient we used to do it just stirring with the spoon and like coconut oil and stuff like Mm -hmm. that and it's good it's okay but with the frother it's really really good it makes all the difference in the world that's just that like, little stick thing with the uh yeah super I cheap you we, get like 10 bucks no i th- 12 yeah, I, bucks think, from Amazon. I think we got one with yeah. some kitchen set or something we bought i might have to just try that in general but yeah, no, we you, use it for our green drinks too it's better than like a magic bullet which is like cool. kind of a hassle um yeah. so with like our green powder drinks we just use the frother and it's fantastic awesome awesome yeah the sugar thing is because like it, that's you know a fairly recent thing that you know is starting to get a little bit more uh traction i guess with people is like realizing mm-hmm. that you know just because something you know all this low fat stuff they they're marketing to you like the fat's not the problem if you look at the no. added sugars yes. nine times out of ten you're going to see more sugar in the low fat thing than you are in the regular fat thing so when my wife and i realized that we switched to just the full fat whatever and there was literally like like there wasn't like you know, it's not like we like gained all this weight or anything there was literally like oh things taste better and there's literally like no difference mm-hmm. in terms of mm-hmm. like you know because you know foods are vice so <laughs> we're up yeah. and down in our weights a little constantly um kind of constantly but uh <laughs> when we're behaving ourselves we're really behaving ourselves yeah but yeah that's that that's cool that's cool so that's coffee so mm-hmm. what about comics what's what's getting you excited so the main comic I've been reading lately has been Firepower um, by mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Kirkman and Chris Samney. So I love that book because it's just like a, it's a story, you know, it's an adventure. And I love adventure stories. I wish in comics we did it a lot more. So often we have like, I don't want to say contrived, but like it's very, uh, there's a lot going on a lot to catch up with stuff is hard to explain or when it's not hard to explain it's like clearly something that's supposed to be a movie so they're trying to like Mm -hmm. sell it and so on and so so forth and i don't want to be negative on comics but i just have to say that to say that fire firepower for me was a breath of fresh air because it was just literally here's a cool story you know and it's not like they can't make a movie out of it but it definitely feels much more like a cool story and uh yeah, so that's that's the book that I'm probably enjoying the most right now. In general, anything that Stuart Eminem draws, oh, of like Sean Murphy, you know, that stuff I'm usually into. And I'm not even I'm not anti comic book events. I haven't read Empire and like the X of Sword stuff yet, but I do want to get into that. I was just waiting for trades for a while. Mm-hmm. And um and also my editor at Marvel he used to give me all the like the PDFs, uh, he's not at Marvel anymore. <laughs> so I'm, I'm debating like, oh man, should I be supportive and get the P and like just go to the comic book store and buy the the graphic novel, the trade, yeah. 
yeah. or should I get the PDFs? The thing is, if I like it, I'm going to want the graphic novel anyway, because I yeah. like, I like having trades on the shelf, especially like big, nice hardcover trades. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. And, and I always want to give a shout out to manga. I'm never current with manga, but I usually go in and pick one up every like so often. So I feverishly read One Punch Man and you know, Blade of the Immortal and stuff like that. So I'm probably going to grab a manga soon. I'm just not sure which one. Okay. Yeah, with the... I'm drastically behind on... Like, I'm not current at all with comics. And I do my best to get trades here and there. But for me, like, it, it would rapidly rapidly become a space issue. And I'm not of the mental mindset just yet of, like, being cool with buying a bunch of trades, reading them, and then eventually just, like passing them on to people or trying to sell them or back or whatever like to me it's just like i i can't i can't you know get that working in my brain so i pretty much converted to mostly digital mm-hmm. Same and, here. I, and that's the thing i'm but i'm still like so far behind uh i i really like for like the past two years i just heavily debated just doing the marvel limited app and mm-hmm. that way i'll be six months behind but i'll be reading you know i can catch up on these events i can do you know i can do all these things and read these books because it's just and especially now that i've got the ipad pro it's like reading on that's just glorious with yeah. comics and it so, is you know so lately my focus has kind of been you know I, I do my best to try to support uh kickstarters and if they have a digital option that's like you know that's great because usually the digital option options like less than 10 bucks and it's like mm-hmm. okay you know and the tr- you know a trade now is like fifteen to twenty bucks you know so I'm like I can you know back four kickstarters or I can go buy one trade right and right I wish I could do both but so you know but I'm also like you know I'm also like of your mindset of like you know I I don't want to disc comics and having continuity and having all these things but you know you mentioned firepower and that's definitely been on my to read list. Mm-hmm. And just you know, just just something to have, just something to be said. Just having a, like an adventure, not having it, you know, having to have reference or be set in a world that's already been so well established, right? And um, and you mentioned like you know you could make it a movie or what have you, and it's like, yeah, it's you could tell the comics that are intended to be movies because there's something missing. I think usually. Yeah, I agree. Not that they're um, all bad. And not no, that, that but a- that's the thing I, we always talk about. Well, like when I'm working on a book and we know that they're going to be showing it around, we always say, okay, but we, don't, we can't think like that when we make the comic because we're fans of comics and comics are best when you make the best use of the medium. And mm-hmm. like I mentioned, One Punch Man, that's such a great example of you would never do that book if you were planning it. You only do that book if you're trying to have the most fun possible. I feel like Invincible is that way too. Like I'm really excited about that Amazon series coming out. Me too. And same thing. That's like, you know, you've got one-eyed aliens punching people's guts out and stuff. (laughs) Like you don't do that when you plan on showing up to a, you know, a room full of corporate people going buy this. You do that because you think it's awesome. Yeah, there's no PG-13 movie headed your way. <laughs> right, right. You know, you know, yet they got a cartoon. And that was my point. Yeah. Like, we, you don't know what's going to be successful. So just do what genuinely excites you. Now, that's obviously a very artist perspective. I do have examples I can bring up where that's been the case. And I can also bring up a lot of examples where people have planned it and it came out, but they're not really happy with it. It's not like a thing they're proud of. And I know for a lot of people, you know, you get that paycheck and it's all worth it. And I don't bemoan that at all. You know, mm-hmm. this is this is a business at the end of the day, and people are trying to make money. And nobody in comics gets paid enough. So, no, you know, I all respect to people who are doing whatever they can to support their families and pay their bills. But as a creator, I like to try to remain as you know in the spirit of that thirteen-year-old kid laying down in the living room floor kind of sketching crazy ideas because (laughs) that to me is still the best actual comics that's the stuff that i read and i'm like that was fun that super excited me that's awesome that's that's a great point of view to have about the whole thing so i that's that's a great uh description of like what's getting you excited about comics now this is what i'm most interested in because 
you know, I've mentioned this plenty of times on previous episodes of the podcast, metal is such a wide berth of styles and subgenres and stuff like that. I'm always interested to hear what people are into because I feel like I'm pretty well versed in a lot of stuff. Yeah. But most of the time someone will mention a band I'm like I've never heard of them. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it's like, oh, I love this band. Like I had Sophie Campbell on and she's like, oh, I really love this band Grave Worm. And I'm like, I've, <laughs> I've heard never heard of Grave Worm. So, <laughs> yeah. so I'm like, you know, making sure that I, I, I'm going to go check out Grave Worm now because, you know, and it's, it's an awesome thing, but it's also like another just, you know, galaxy brain moment of like, oh my God, there's just like all these bands that yeah, I've just never heard of that are just killing it out there. So, you know, I, I'm curious to see what your answer is here. So, so is that the question? What, yes, what am I yeah, into? But, no, yeah, what metal, what metal are you digging right now? What's got you excited? So right now I've reintroduced myself to Between the Buried and Me. Um, okay. I've always been fans of theirs. I like all styles of Between the Buried and Me. There's one of those like super versatile bands mm-hmm. that sometimes they're evolution or their changes turn people turn like the old fans off but i'm with them kind of like through all of the changes and i'm sorry man I, my cat is going nuts in the background is that loud for you <laughs> i can't it, it, it's coming through pretty good but it's fine uh life noises okay. life happens um she, she hears me talking it's getting close to her feeding time and oh, she's trying okay. to be just absolutely the worst <laughs> she's well, just at, at literally point- making noise to get my attention at any point in the podcast, you need to go make sure that kitty gets fed. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> All right. We're going to hold off out of spite. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So my standbys, I like I love Arc Enemy. I love um, the Black Dahlia murder. I'm also a big prog nerd. So I love Opeth and Dream Theater. Mm-hmm. Uh, the bands that I've really been into lately have been more on the quote unquote genty side of things. So uh, Animals as Leaders, Polyphia. Uh, which is uh, not really gent, more like this kind of new proggy thing that's going on. Um, yeah, so that's, the, you know, and, and there's actually like Chimp Spanner I love. Uh, there's a guy named Matt Hartnett who I think he only put out like one album, but it's so good. And I don't think anyone knows about it. And it's just like one of my favorite um, instrumental genty prog albums. Okay. Uh, I actually just started listening to Al Joseph's stuff, not the Hive Mind stuff, but his personal instrumental stuff I've really been getting into. So you know, and I still like the, you know, the greats. I still like, I actually was just learning uh, the solo from Mouthful War on guitar <laughs> from nice. Pantera. And uh, I want to learn, I and I have no guilty pleasures, only pleasures. So I like mm-hmm. Avenged Sevenfold. Um, and I wanted to learn a few of their songs and solos recently. Uh, the only metal I don't like is new metal. Outside of okay. new metal, I'm probably fairly into everything. Okay. It, it, it's, it's fair. I've... Uh... You know, I have a soft spot for a lot of new metal. Not all of it. A lot of it is really, it really is trash. But there's some standouts I think in there. But I'm not, I'm not here to defend <laughs> the honor <laughs> of new metal. Uh, so you mentioned a lot of bands I've, I'm familiar with. So I'm, I'm like, okay, okay. But a couple of things still, I'm like, oh, I gotta go check this out. Uh-huh. Um, so that's interesting to hear the, the proggy stuff because, um, in you know, whenever we've chatted on Twitter and stuff like that. I don't, I don't think I caught that, that you're into the proggy stuff, but you know, it, it does kind of lead me to one of the, one of the things that I've been thinking about, uh, I want to discuss with you. It seems like, you know, you, your art, you, you operate on a professional level, hands down, no doubt you're a pro, um, musically. Um, but I don't think I've heard any of your music. I, you know, you know, your stuff, and it seems like to me, like despite having this high level of of skill in the things you do, you seem to really have a lot of passion to being like a student of those things. Uh, with just be it your art style, where you've you experiment with different art styles, and you're constantly pushing yourself to do something a little different. And you know, you've worked on a wide berth of books that are just drastically different, like. You know, Witchblade is not Ms. Marvel, is not, you know, Romulus, is not bite size. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, in our discussions about learning music and all that, you seem to, you know, have a great uh, excitement and passion for, like, pushing yourself and, like, finding these, you know, 
finding this information and, and applying it when it comes to learning music. And that's something, you know, I, I greatly admire. And I was wondering if, if it doesn't feel like you're constantly pushing or is it just like, I love this stuff so much. I just can't not, you know, always try to find, you know, some new thing to add into my skill set. So it's funny you ask that because uh, recently I've realized what my actual passion is and I can kind of trace back the uh, the breadcrumbs to when I started to realize this. So my first mm -hmm. job was actually in animation, which is okay. part of the reason I like working in different styles because to work in animation, I had to completely leave like quote unquote realistic drawing or even comic book drawing behind and work in this really simple cartoony style. But it taught me a whole lot about art you know, uh, working in that style, I had to learn shapes and forms and how to move things in space. I couldn't get away with uh, comic book tricks to make anything look cool. And I couldn't copy a photograph to make something look cool. Like you have to have a good sound feeling for shapes. And at the same time, I was doing storyboarding. So it wasn't necessarily useful to learn comic book storytelling, even though comic book storytelling is very, you know, it's great and awesome in its way. But I had to learn the roots of actual storytelling. So like Aristotle and, you know, certain film directors and reading Stephen King and Robert McKee and stuff like that. Like you had to understand what, or I at least felt like I had to understand where my writers were coming from with the stuff that they were talking about. I didn't want to be just like an art monkey who wanted to draw what they wanted to draw and the writers had to deal with it. So going through that process, I realized that I was actually having more fun learning new stuff than doing the same thing over and over again. Like other comic book people who get in that position are sometimes like, yeah, this isn't for me. You know, I want to go back to doing my stuff. I have my style. And, and I, I love those artists too. Like there's few things more fun to watch than an artist who really, you know, knows what they're going for all the time. And they kind of nail that thing, you know, like you know, like listening to at the gates do pedal notes. Like I, I can yeah. listen to that all day because they're like the best at it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, but that's not me. And what I like to do is I like to learn new things. I like to explore. And that's, that's honestly my real passion is learning and then art and music and storytelling and, and everything else, you know, gaming, guitar, that stuff is all branching out from the trunk of a passion of learning. Okay. So that that's an excellent answer. <laughs> and and uh, I didn't know you worked in animation before. Now it makes like complete and total sense. Like just how you just can almost seemingly effortlessly, <laughs> even though it's a, a, a great deal of skill behind it, just kind of like switch it up and, and do things. Cause you know, you put the work in and you had to get the, you had to get it down. Like you said, you can't, if you're drawing something extremely cartoony or exaggerated you, no photo reference is going to really going to do that for you you have to get the shapes you have to get the movement you have to get the you know the the force of objects and and, and all the that kind of stuff working with each other and uh i've noticed that it's i guess that's that's what's really i think interesting about your art with your comic book art where it's you managed to really straddle that line of having that motion and that movement of animation and but still it looks like comic book art it doesn't look mm -hmm. like an animator drawing a comic which isn't an, always a bad thing but it's it's definitely a look it's like something yeah. like like yeah you, i think that's a danger for animators is they yeah. get into comics and they think they can basically storyboard their way through it and they don't and this is for anybody who's listening who's either doing comics or coming from animation into comics comics is its own visual language built off of symbolism it's not mm -hmm. built off of objects animation is built off of objects now yes there's, there's objects in motion but even if you took and they have books like this right like i actually have yeah. one on the shelf for steam boy even when you take the still the steam the still frames of animation and you kind of turn it into a comic book that it's that's not what makes comics great because it doesn't allow you to have the rhythm and the emotional flexibility. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So you can't take an art style or uh, art sensibilities that are designed to be in motion, 
make it still and expect it to be as effective as an art style or art language designed to be still, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like that should seem obvious, but you know, as artists, we think of oh, the eyes straight and the nose right, or the proportions okay, is the perspective okay? Then this should look good, but that's that's not really the game when it comes to uh, yeah. comics, and um, that's that's why a lot of people who come over to comics from other places they greatly underestimate the learning curve and wind up making books that um, that don't, like you said, don't really feel like comic books. It feels like someone else doing a comic book. Yeah, it's kind of like those uh, young younger reader Spider-Mans and stuff like that where they were literally taking stills from the show, from mm-hmm. the animated shows, and just making it into a comic book and cutting and pasting and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's it's definitely, it's... Comics is a storytelling as an art form that can, if you don't respect it the right way, if you don't come at yes. it the right way, it will it will make you show your ass real fast. <laughs> you know what's funny? I feel that pretty much everything is like that, but I really feel like that about metal too. Mm. So recently, I've been getting into um, like other forms of music via guitar, right? Yeah. So I'm expanding my chord knowledge into more jazz and R&B and neo soul. And sometimes you'll find these guitar players who are excellent players. Same thing as like with the animator, excellent yeah. artist, right? Yeah. Excellent players, but you ask them to do metal and it, no <laughs> offense, sucks. It's horrible. Oh, no, I, I had a whole rant about this where it's like, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll watch this YouTube demo or whatever. It's like this guy who's like, He's like a bluesy jazzy player. He's like, okay, I'm testing out this new amp or whatever. He's like, here's a metal riff. And like the palm mutes are just atrocious. Yeah. And it's like, he's not even like alternate picking correctly. It's just this, it's just this weird mess of like, that's what metal is. Like, it's almost like disrespectful. It's like, what? <laughs> that's what you think metal is, man. Right. And then, you know, and on the flip side, I can, you know, not all, that's not always the case, of course, but I can go to uh, a metal youtuber channel or whatever and they they try some of the cleans or stuff and they're playing like these like beautifully like jazzy you know intros because metal takes in so much influence from everything else these days that when you're learning other band songs or you're trying to differentiate yourself from other bands and stuff and you take in these you know be it like a clean jazzy influence or like animals as leaders like Mm -hmm. they're metal but they're also like so many other things or like yeah i don't know if you've heard of this crazy ass band called 12 foot ninja yeah i love them actually yeah uh, i just yeah, learned yeah. about them like a year ago loved, and, and, loved and them, it's loved just like stuff. it's like in the middle of like this huge heavy genty you know massive uh rift all of a sudden there's like a banjo break or something and it's like mm-hmm. okay and so it's like metal is is kind of like is is constantly evolving and and growing it's not and there's definitely like mainstays for things and things like that. But I think if you learn these days, if you're learning metal and newer metal songs and even older metal songs that have taken in a lot of these influences, you become more well-rounded than you would if you were just strictly playing blues, strictly playing pop, strictly playing jazz. Because there's just so much, again, just I'm repeating myself, this is just so much other, inf- so many other influences into metal that, yeah, you do, you do show your, you do show your lack of uh, comfort <laughs> will, will be nice. Be lack of comfort with that style if you, if you're not familiar with it and you try to do it. Yeah, metal can be um, the the metal that I like. All metal isn't like this, but the metal that I like is extremely percussion based, right? Mm-hmm. So whether you go on back to like Master of Puppets and Slayer and Pantera, or even in the modern times to again Animals as Leaders, uh, you know the bands we've named, stuff like that. Um, it's very, very, very percussive, even in the guitar. It, I don't know yeah. if you saw that James Brown movie, Get On Up, with uh, Chadwick Boseman. No, I did not. There's this one great scene where he's talking to his band, and he he asks them, "What's that instrument you have right there?" And the guy says, uh, "I think he I think he says it's a saxophone or something, right?" And he goes, "No, it's not. Try again." And oh, it might have been a horn. And he, he and you know they, he eventually gets what James is saying. He goes, "It's a drum," and he goes, "Exactly." And what's that instrument? And the guitar player says, "It's a drum." And they go throughout the band. And everybody says, "There's a drum." And so James says, "So if we're all sitting here banging in our drums, as long as we're in the groove, it doesn't matter what key we're in, we're gonna sound all right." Do, do your ears say it sounds good? Then it sounds good, right? And mm-hmm. so 
that was basically a dissertation on <laughs> funk music, right? Yeah. He was literally, like, I have a joke. I say there's two ways to sing funk music, James Brown and Incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that's going to get a lot of people mad, and it's a joke, but it's also, there's the truth in it, that which is why I tell it, because... James' singing style is so percussive. He really mm -hmm. did join the band as a vocal drummer. And you actually see that in rap music. If you listen to Eminem or Busta Rhymes or something like mm -hmm. that, Kendrick Lamar, these guys, there's times when they'll get more melodic, but they're also their talent. You can, they have the same talent as a good drummer. They know how to you know, divide up a rhythm and uh, play on and off of a beat. And metal, fewer than any other forms of music, and I say this as a person who, you know, was in a band. It the, if you were with your drummer and your drummer was good, that was literally diff the difference between being a good band and a bad band. Totally, you could have the sickest guitar players, the best singer. If the drummer was trash, you would be okay at best. And you could have thoroughly average guitar players, like me in my band. And our drummer, Rick, rest in peace, was hitting. And he elevated us to the next level, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that double bass pedal, I, obviously every metal band doesn't use double bass pedal. I mean, yeah. they should, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when that double bass pedal is hitting the right way and, and those those uh, syncopated rhythms and those polyrhythms are coming in, I, I haven't mentioned much sugar yet, Jesus, but oh, yeah. like, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorite bands, the inventors of gent, basically. Every, everything's, everything's a drum in Meshuggah. <laughs> right, right, right. And I mean, sometimes they literally go through a whole song and they play two notes. Yeah. And that, but the, because the spirit is in the, I don't know if I want to call it groove, because some metal bands groove and yeah. some groove more often than others. In metal, it's a different thing. It's, it's a punch, man. It's a punch in the face. It's a stank. And if you don't get that, if you don't listen for that kind of thing, the spirit of that, listening to like reading the sheet music for metal is almost worthless. <laughs> I yeah, I I don't read sheet music. Um, I used to be able to, but I yeah. If if I saw it now, I'm sure it'd just be like this flurry of lines and dots, and mm -hmm. I'm like, we're, I'm like, and it's even 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 now days with metals, like even like tabs, you don't really get it with the tabs either. No, that's the way no. you do it. And thank God for YouTube. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. So like, that's what he kind of does. And uh, I remember, I, I'm trying to remember for life and what song it was or what riff I was trying to get. And I just, I had the tab in front of me. I couldn't figure it out. And then I just came across a video of the guy playing it live. I'm like, oh, when he's doing this slide up, he's, he's actually, you know, unintentionally or intentionally giving it a slight bend. So it's mm -hmm. going like, mm -hmm. like not even, not, not even a quarter out of you know up it's going like an eighth up or and that's just that little thing that that little nuance where it's like okay okay now this sounds right because you know thankfully i had the visual of it but if there's like sheet music for that i don't know how it would have just been like you know the same thing as the tab like like oh technically this is the the fret or the note he was intending to play or whatever so yeah with metal it's this it's this weird you know, mishmash of like, not only is there like a, an extreme technicality to a lot of the stuff, but within that technicality, there's also a ton of feel. Yeah. And like you said, like you have to have that groove, you know, and it's not all metal, not all metal grooves, but you know, one of my favorite bands is uh, Gojira. Oh yeah. Gojira is great. And as much as I love the riffs, you know, as much as I love, you know, I have uh, Joe Duplantier's custom pick up in in one in my telecaster <laughs> you know as much as i love the riffs and the sound without joe the drummer that band would not be where they are right cuz he can he can go from that punch to a groove to like these weird jazzy things and it's just like there's this whole thing where it's just like he's adds so much like you're saying to the overall sound and it's not like you know and I could just imagine so many other less uh, creative drummers would just be like a drum machine. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, here's yeah. beat one, little fill, beat two, you know. And meanwhile, you know, this guy's operating on like this huge amount of groove and feel that just brings up a simple three note riff into something like just like massive and huge. So, 
And totally. I, I think this is true for all forms of music, um, but it's important in metal for the reasons we've highlighted. You can always tell the difference between someone who learned their instrument in their room and mm-hmm. someone who learned constantly listening to other players in a room and like practice, you know? And the same way you can tell the difference between someone who has had to record and someone yeah. who's never had to record, right? <laughs> And when a drummer is constantly listening to guitar players and bass players, I mean, bass is really just another guitar, um, and guitar players are constantly listening to drummers and, if necessary, leaving space for singers, um, or in the case of uh, certain jazz bands and fusion bands, maybe leaving space for improvisation where they have to listen, you can hear, and blues musicians have described it as this, if you inhale and you all, and you don't play anything and then you exhale and that's when you play the music sounds better like the biggest mistake blues players make when they're first learning blues and they haven't really played with a band is they're just fiddly diddly woodly diddly the whole time mm-hmm. right uh blues lick after b- blues lick and they don't breathe because the guitar is an essentially vocal instrument and the same thing happens with when the guitar is a, a percussive instrument and that's what i love about the guitar is it can be super melodic it can be super vocal. It can be more like a piano or it can be more like a drum. And as a guitar player, when you've been through those phases of your instrument in your respective form of music, you are going to sound way better because it's automatically in your playing now. You're never going to go back to that bedroom guitar player that's just yeah. stacking impressive tricks on top of impressive tricks. And because of the rhythmic importance of metal, it's even I'm not going to say it's more prominent, but it's very, very prominent in a very specific way. No, totally. That makes 100% complete sense because, you know, just going full blast, you know, like, it's just... When I first got back into playing guitar after, like, five or six years of not touching it a few years ago, I, like, instantly jumped into recording. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, boy, did it show me so many things <laughs> that I was not aware of myself like just like your fallacies become way uh way exposed and that was great i was really glad that i had that opportunity because i don't have the overall opportunity to like go join a band do all that stuff Mm -hmm. but if i have this extra critical tool that does not lie to me (laughs) right right (laughs) you know I, i i can listen like even if i record a solo i really like you know, I'm like, well, let me take off the delay. Let me take off the, the extra game. Let me take off all this stuff and listen to just the DI track of it. And it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, I could really have hit that better with, you know, and it just, you know, it, it does this kind of like lay you bare and raw. So if someone is listening and they're like, you know, and they and they are like me and you can't you can't get that experience with other musicians right now or or no one can right now, really. But yeah, um, but, you know, start recording your like it's super easy to start recording yourself now oh especially now my god I, in fact um if we're nerding out here i oh, let's, um let's do it <laughs> i recently started playing through bias effects oh too, okay in yeah. the ipad yeah and it like i'm an old fart i'm 42 man and when i was growing up in the 90s lower cost guitars and like amp programs and lower cost amps sounded god awful Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they were so bad like to get that's why certain producers oh man their names are escaping me right now but certain like producers and engineers in the metal world became super like famous because they could get like this slick you know wet saturated guitar sound but it was still clean and melodic because people were going out there with like bad crates and bef- not 5150s <laughs> but like bad pvs and playing yeah. and dual rectifiers but not like having the nice setup to really bring the most out of the amp so it's kind of like this harsh but not quite distorted enough tone and now i can plug into my ipad and mm-hmm. literally sound twice as good as anything from back then and within about 80 percent of the best equipment out there yeah if not more it is nuts. It's really insane. And like you said, there's no excuse now. And you're absolutely like when you don't, when you can't play with other musicians in terms of uh, like listening to a drummer or stuff like that or playing like with another guitar player, obviously there's stuff you're going to miss out on. But mm-hmm. as you said, when you record and you not only have to get it right, but you have to listen to yourself. 
Like that's one of the most important aspects of listening is a lot of guitar players don't listen to themselves. And so, like you said, they don't know what they're missing out on. They don't, they don't know what they're, uh, you know, when they're not clean and, and, and when they're not, you know, hitting it right or when, when their habits are starting to come out and stuff like that. So I think if you have the, you can't, I don't know if you can do it with the iPhone because they have the no headphone jack thing. But yeah, if you have, and I don't know what Android devices do with it, but on an iPad, like specifically, that for between, I think it's like 350 to 900 bucks, you can get an iPad roughly. Uh, I think the latest standard iPad is like 300 bucks. Jeez, yeah. it's 300 bucks. And then you get the uh, iRig. For, and yeah. I, I'm not sponsored or anything. I just love this no. stuff. No, you, you, get, I, you get iRig 40 bucks. And then a, a good cable give you another 15 bucks. Mm-hmm. And then I bought every amp on the app because <laughs> the, the full stop it was like $70 or something like that. Yeah, something like that, I think. Man, take my money. This stuff sounds incredible. <laughs> Incredible. If you're a guitar player and you're not doing that already, you're talking about for the price of um, any, you know, mediocre bedroom amplifier. I guess you can get a decent one. Like you can get a Boss Katana or a Pop. Yeah, the Katana, you know, like even like oh, like you're great. saying though, like even like the low cost amplifiers are like amazing now. They are. So, like, like even, they are way better than before. And the latest Line 6 Spiders, which were like the epitome of like shitty bedroom guitar tone, like they had like updates and firmware updates and instead of like you know ha- having this weird speaker setup they had right where it was basically i believe i may be wrong but i believe it was like you were it was already emulating a speaker and it was just and it wasn't an actual guitar um configured speak speaker being in there it was just like a regular speaker and now they have actual you know guitar rated speakers and you're actually pushing through there and it's like it's just it's night and day um my rig is all digital like i don't have anything analog aside from you know the actual guitars themselves and you know i have i i I didn't purchase any uh outside stuff for the ipad and all that but there's you know the free versions have stuff you can use Mm -hmm. so i i have my ipad i have an irig that i can you know go and i've been looking at this thing called the um it's 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 spelled nux and i guess that technically it's new x is the brand but you basically it, you plug it into the input of your guitar you put your headphone jack into it and you have some like really awesome like tones mm-hmm. and you can just play like that without the phone without the because i got the whole irigan setup because i'm like oh yeah i can just you know i can bring this out you know when i'm out with the you know in the living room with the kids or something but it's like a mess of wires yeah <laughs> yeah uh but you know so that's just you know a kid attractant but this is like i just <laughs> plug it i just plug it in and i have one one wire going to my headphones and that's it it's like how like how crazy is that but uh yeah it i, I love nerding out about this stuff i was going to get to this i was going to ask you like what are you running through what's you know what gear do you have because as much as i love i do love talking about you know the art tools people use i kind of feel like that conversation has been kind of like there's only there's it's diminishing returns because we all kind of use the same stuff right yeah yeah i mean who who doesn't use either a cintiq or huon with photoshop or clip studio like who's yeah. really who doesn't know? use kyle webster brushes or friend and brushes or right, the stock right, brushes right. or they use their own brushes you know, but with, gu- but with guitar, it's still like this wild west of like, well, what do you do? Like, do, yes. you, do you use a boss katana and then you plug it into your computer? Do you just work strictly in GarageBand on your iPad or your phone? Like, so or- he- here's my current setup. So right now, uh, I'm primarily working through bias effects. And funny enough, you actually kind of hit on a little bit of it. Uh, you know, you were talking about playing clean mm-hmm. so that you can hear your stuff. I've actually recently gone the opposite way. Okay. And I'm playing with full effects on, mm-hmm. but it's for a specific reason. It's because it's about controlling the distortion, right? Yeah. Like I've played for years and years and years clean, and now it's about putting only as much, um, only as much pressure on the guitar, particularly during like legato work, mm-hmm. to get the sound. And you don't want to put not one piece of pressure more than than necessary to produce the sound and that 
raises your accuracy of pressure, not just your accuracy of placement and timing. So doing that, I've been doing that through bias effects. Uh, like I said, I bought every single amp and I use a uh, preset, like, you know, downloaded Pliny setting. Uh, Pliny is another band yeah, I absolutely yeah. love. Yeah. So I use Pliny lead tones. I use animal as, animals as leaders, uh, clean and lead tones. I use a downloaded Opeth tone. And I'm actually really into funk as well. So mm-hmm. I have a Corey Wong uh, Wolfpack okay. tone that sounds fantastic. But when I go live again, I'm going to be using the Line 6 Pod Go. Oh, that's, that, that's really good too. Like That's professional equipment for yeah. 500 bucks. It's insane. Yeah. It's the, absolutely insane. I, if I had a reason to play out, I would definitely be going with like a Pod Go or I think... I think Fractal has a, a similarly priced AX device that's like that. But yeah, like those floorboard modelers are just like insane. Like even the, even the little shitty Zoom GX1 that I have that was like, you know, 70 bucks on sale. Like even the amp modelers on that, they're like, they're not completely terrible. Like, and right. if o- almost know, nothing sounds bad now, like, yeah. It's hard to find a bad sound. Like if you if you if you sound bad, you're doing that on purpose because yeah. <laughs> for free, like you can go on YouTube and and look up free awesome metal tone, and it is it's yeah. a free awesome metal tone. Now I will say that if you're a serious player, I think um, five hundred bucks is a fair. Pro- I mean, obviously the iPad. Oh, I think it's, I think it's, yeah, I think five, extraordinarily um, fair price for top of the line sound, totally. which is what the Helix the the Helix I think is like. A little more, it's like six hundred bucks, the cheapest Helix. But I think the line, from what I've seen, for a simple setup, the Line Six Pod Go is probably a better overall purchase. I mean, app, you know, and it, it, it uses the Helix architecture. And to yeah. explain this to someone who's not sure what the hell we're talking about, <laughs> oh um, right, Line Six <laughs> has this. Out. Line Six has this professional line of amp modelers and cabinet simulations and things like that, um, effects and all this stuff. Uh, the company's Line Six, and they. It's called the Helix, and these are like you know when it first like thousand dollar plus equipment you know when it first came out and all that. And Line Six Pod was kind of like Line Six's initial offering to amp modeling and stuff like that. Like in the early two thousands, there was the Pod, which was like it looks like a giant red bean almost, and it was you know very popular for a while because I think even like Weezer used it to tour with, like mm-hmm. they used Pods one tour or whatever. Now, historically, it, it you know, looking back at it, it's like 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 CGI in older movies. It's like, yeah, yeah. Like at the time, it was like, wow, so cool. And then now, it's like, mm, I don't know about that. Um, but you because know, back been, then, good sound was so pricey that yeah, most people sounded kind of bad. Exactly. So you know, so now that Line Six is wanted like this more portable device, more budget friendly, because five hundred dollars for a really professional level sound and for, for your guitar, like that's a fraction of what you'd pay if you were running a real amp, a real cab, a real pedal board. Like, so pot, Line 6 used the, the brains of the Helix, essentially, to transfer to the Pod Go, and it just upped the level of that quality, you know, instantly and it's, it's it's been kind of been like all the rage and you don't even have that like now there's these like lunchbox amps which are just these tiny like tube amps that are 20 watts but they get loud as shit and they can play a gig mm-hmm. with them and and you know you can the sounds are comparable to you know 2500 dollar amps it's insane um half of the amp modelers i use on my my computer i've got free and they mm-hmm. sound amazing, you know, and there's some I paid for. Um, the main one I used, I did pay for, but it's like, I had a, I got a crazy good deal on it when it was first being launched, but it's the STL Tones Will Putney mm-hmm. suite. And Will Putney is a, a modern metal producer. He's produced like tons of bands. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think even some of the bands you've mentioned and mm-hmm. uh, he had, and I like using uh, the, the mix I use now is like a diesel amp sim mixed with a uh, 5150 amp sim or sometimes I switched up with the Mesa triple crown 
which is kind of like Mesa Boogie's version of the JCM 800, which is kind of like a pretty classic metal guitar yeah. tone. Like if you've heard of Zach Wild, he uses JC, he's like the most popular JCM 800 guy, I think. I've Zach played Wild. through JCM 800s and on up with the Marshalls. Mm-hmm. I have always found that when it came to metal, like I love Marshall amps as guitar amplifiers, but for me, for metal, they just weren't saturated enough because I like a really like super yeah. saturated sound. So for me, the 5150 was always the, uh, the gold standard for, for a metal mm-hmm. sound. It's still, uh, which is, is, still is say again. It, it still is. I think in a yeah. lot of people's eyes, in my eyes, it's like, like I mentioned, I love Gojira. They use 5150, I think mm-hmm. they use 5153s. I'm not yeah. sure, mm-hmm. but and, I mean, and, and, yeah. and the 5153, 5152, it's all the same kind of family, yeah. same basic sound. Uh, de- and depending on your guitar and your settings, you can kind of get to the same place, which is why the Line 6 Pod Go is so exciting to me because it's like you can get extraordinarily close to that sound, but mm-hmm. then you also can get extraordinarily close to sounds that the 5150 has no hope of achieving. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right? Like, I'd rather be 96% of a 5150 sound and also 96% of, like, a Fender twin reverb, whatever, <laughs> you know, and, than yeah. be 100% of only one of those things. Yeah, and the thing is like just that percentage of sounds for those amps it still sounds really good it's still so, the, the average person's not going to care especially Even if you're playing the live average person that's the crazy thing is like you you i'm sure you've seen all of these like blindfold tests and stuff mm-hmm, like that mm-hmm. these guys get fooled all the time and they literally spend all day around amplifiers i think yeah. we get so attached to the idea of certain equipment because of its legacy, because of what it means, and also like what it means to be able to buy something really nice, right? Yeah. So I was I was going to buy a new Fender because I've never owned a Fender before, okay. and I didn't play Fender music, but now I'm playing a lot more Fender music in addition to the metal stuff. Like I said, a lot more funk and, and everything else. Always been a fan of the Chili Peppers, and I was trying the Fenders out in the store. And Fender has kind of done the same thing to themselves that Line 6 did with the Pod Go, where their Squire line Mm -hmm. is so good now. Oh, yeah, totally. And their their main line is like, this isn't, it's not not as bad as like Gibson, but they're they're still not PRS. Like they're so inconsistent that with a Fender, I really feel like don't go to like, um, you know what do you call it like uh still water or or whatever sweet water on, sweet water sweet water uh don't go to like sweet water or something online because you don't know what guitar you're getting like you have to go to the, you can do that with a prs right like you can mm-hmm. do that with a you know a kiesel guitar or something like that like maybe a solar like a you know more of a boutique brand because their quality is so consistent and with fender it's not that their quality goes from like good to bad it's more like Sometimes that Squire factory pumps out a gem. Mm-hmm. And sometimes the main Fender factory, it's just like, okay, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, change, it doesn't change the world or anything. And you can literally go into a guitar store, try out 10 Fenders, and find for some reason this Squire has just the magic. And I've literally seen people do this on YouTube, like fail a blindfold test. Like, is that seriously a Squire right there? Like, I can't believe mm-hmm. it. Uh, one of my favorite blues youtubers i think chris buck is his name um he played through a fender most of the time he has like the greatest i mean through a squire most of the time so he has like two guitars a three thousand dollar fender and like a 160 pound squire you know uh english currency yeah um and he says listen to them (laughs) like they're not that different and Mm -hmm. i use the squire because if i lose the squire i'm not going to be heartbroken i can't take this fender out of the house it costs me over three grand (laughs) You no, know, so it, yeah. yeah, I can't, I cannot in my life fathom spending any more than like 500 bucks on any guitar or bass. Like I have a, a, a decent collection and like my main guitar is my Squire John five Telecaster, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, and my second main guitar I just picked up this year from uh, Mike Norton. He was selling it cause it wasn't for him. Oh. It was it was it's a jackson was it the js22 like the cheap the like one of the cheapest jacksons mm-hmm. and i love the damn thing and mm-hmm. it, it it doesn't hurt he also like sold me the invader pickups which are like just amazing yeah um that you know 
and like the most expensive guitar I have, I think is they're my basses. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have a five string uh, Mexican Fender where that was a gift for my wife though. Uh, same thing with my uh, Squire bass six, which is kind of like the, um, it's like a 30 inch scale six string guitar, but it was, it's tuned an octave lower but I've mm-hmm. strung it and I've added a humbucker to it. So now it's just like a, a, a really mean baritone. And uh, I have an American Fender, but I got that from a pawn shop. Okay. You know, and but my main base is my $300 Ibanez EDB 600 that I've had since 1999. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like I can't imagine spending just th- that money on an instrument for other than like the the prestige i guess or if just you know i know some people like they can't see past that or like they've having that authentic gibson or whatever that's that's something important to them and that's fine i mean this it's whatever excites you but i think just for value per dollar it goes down drastically once you get past the fender squire ranges or the gibson epiphone ranges oh yeah there's definitely with musical instruments there's definitely a diminishing returns i think it is a little more dependent on brand so for mm-hmm. instance with gibson like if you're talking about an epiphone i do think you can get a nice value epiphone but a, a less paul you almost have to start at like 900 bucks with a less paul because mm-hmm. they don't make good cheap guitars like they, their their cheap guitars are a mess. Like they haven't got. It's, it's like how Fender used to be. Squires used to be terrible. Yeah, you know they were horrible, and now they're great. Like now they're fantastic guitars. So I, if somebody's playing a Fender, I wouldn't recommend they spend more than four hundred fifty bucks on a spend on a, on a Fender because unless you are that super serious, you're probably not going to tell the difference. And any difference you could tell, you can probably just pay to have it done. Like you can. Mm-hmm. If you need the frets worked on, if it doesn't come with locking tuners for some reason, if you want to upgrade the pickup, by all means do that. But it's still going to be cheaper than a a Fender that plays as well, because with Fender, you're going to pay a certain price for the factory. Now, for me, the exception is certain brands like with PRS. PRS guitars to me are so fantastic. Like I'm such a fan. I've been a fan ever since I first heard of PRS. Like I could just tell it was different. It just sounded better. It played better. It was like the most amazing guitar I could see and I could never afford it. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I have a PRS and every time I think about buying a new guitar, I come home and play the PRS and I get like <laughs> demotivated to like buy, you know, some other guitar or something like that. Cause I'm just like, ah, you're so good. But so I think, I think certain band, band brands like that, like the PRS again, I think those Kiesel guitars are really nice. Like, and if you want a seven string, I do think it's worth your money to pay out for a little higher end seven string because the seven string requires certain attention to detail on like yes. the neck and the scaling Definitely. that, you know what I mean? Your seven string will play significantly worse if you try to uh, cheap out on it more so yeah. than again, a six string guitar, which if you can't find a good six string for 500 bucks, you're not looking very hard. No, no. Especially with, you know, brands like Toman's Harley Benton Oh yeah. and you know just again just a squire like um i i have ordered from sweetwater before and i do like it um but you know was you know it's you can was, the thing i like about sweetwater is they do do an inspection and a setup on the guitar before they send mm-hmm. it to you I, depending on the price range but squires hit that price range but you can also pick the guitar like the exact guitar they'll have like a fo- like five photos it's like mm-hmm. pick, pick the one you want so if you like the wood grain on this one a little bit more you pick that one um but yeah you can't like even these like like if you go to youtube and like just type in like cheapest guitar or whatever you'll see countless videos on these youtubers buying these 79 dollar to 100 dollar guitars and them basically saying like it's not bad like it's because mm-hmm. i first started playing bass around uh 97 98 Mm-hmm. And my first bass was a Squire bass, mm-hmm. and that thing was terrible. The frets suck. <laughs> yeah. The frets suck. The pickups were super low output, and you know everything else was mainly fine. And, you know the tuners were okay. The bridge was okay. The electronics were bleh. So when I did upgraded to my Ibanez, it was like this. Like it was, 
I, I had this moment when I was playing my Ibanez and I was doing stuff like almost effortlessly. Mm-hmm, I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I actually do know how to play. Yeah. Even though I didn't. <laughs> but, you know, just in that in that novice moment of like, oh, I, I do know how to play. And then so the fact that, you know, players now can kind of start at that level mm-hmm. of like comfort with their instrument, like because, you know, a, a couple fret sprouts or rough edges on the frets or whatever, or, you know, slightly noisy pickups. That's nothing. Like you said, you can just change that stuff out so fast mm-hmm. and and instantly like have a great sounding guitar like and i you know i know people have debates about tone woods and things like that personally i'm like for metal like i think tone wood is irrelevant <laughs> yeah that's the thing about it's, you yeah. know like for, so if you put together everything we said right uh so because the amplifiers are so good and the modeling mm-hmm. is so good those modelers make almost any guitar sound fantastic yep. just to start out with and so now you're going from you know yeah, that sounds great, but I like this even more. Okay, but do you like it for twenty five hundred more dollars? <laughs> like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, like no. <laughs> do you like it that much more? You know, and so, and for people, for people who that's their entire life, I get it. But if and here's the thing, even if you're touring, it goes back to the Chris Buck thing. You would rather, not, you know, be safe and secure that you're not going to lose three grand on the road because so many bad things happen to guitars on the road between mm-hmm. theft and getting banged around and the wrong person changes took it. And, yeah. yeah, flights and, you know, vans. Like, that's a very, very dangerous place to have just three to seven grand just floating around when for 500, like you said, 500, 600, 700 bucks, you're getting not only are you getting most of the same sound like from an analytical perspective but when you when you play live the sound guy controls your sound yeah (laughs) you just give him you just start the conversation with your guitar and your amplifier the sound guy will determine whether you sound fantastic or okay or bad so you know it like the difference between your five thousand dollar guitar and your $1,000 guitar or a $700 guitar, it's not going to come through in that environment. It'll mm-hmm. only literally come through in pretty much recording. Yep. So are you going to buy an instrument that's... And, and if you're recording, again, don't record through your iPad with your $3,000 guitar. Now you have to pay <laughs> for a professional who's going to bring out all of that sound. They have to turn every knob to the right place and mm-hmm. put you know every effect and and um you know compressor and noise gate in the right (laughs) order at the right level in the chain to bring that sound out like if you're not a professional you're not going to be able to get that fender custom shop to sound twice as good as a modern you know butterscotch squire (laughs) it's not (laughs) happening man (laughs) so it's it's all about context you know It's, it's all about context and i feel like like you said for a metal show you want to be loud and clean and crisp and not noisy. Yeah. You know, and, and if you if you get those things, you're going to sound fantastic. If your mids are popping through, mm-hmm. um, if you're boosting your solos properly and you're compressing your, your rhythm properly, mm-hmm. stay in time with your drummer and you're going to sound fantastic. The difference between your, again, 500 to $5,000 guitar is not, it's not that big of, it's not that big of a deal compared to all the other stuff. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it is such a like vast difference of just what you're mentioning context. Like, and even then, you do all those fancy things to bring out the the natural superiority <laughs> of your super expensive instrument. And it's like, what is it for? Is it making the song better? Is it? And nine times out of ten, it's not. Hell, we you mentioned Meshuga. They recorded entirety of one of their albums with guitar rig which is one Mm -hmm. of like the earliest amp simulators and people went nuts for it like people still Mm -hmm. try to get that sound and it's like it was just you know it's probably and it has nothing to really do with i think the sound it was just like they wrote really great songs that people connected to and the you know the the it didn't have to be this perfect super you know exceptional rig even though I'm pretty sure the Meshuggah guys play really nice guitars. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? The, you know, I, I saw Meshuggah fairly recently. Um, 
and it was one of the best shows ever. But it really was just about how heavy they were, how mm-hmm. in time they were, how their light show was, which was amazing, like the best metal light show I'd ever seen. But it wasn't their tone. No. Yeah, you know, like I, I mean, as you can tell, like I listen to this stuff all of the time. Uh, you know, both the metal side and the tone side, and their tone wasn't coming. It's so many effects on it. Like the tone yeah. of your guitar is not coming out. I, I think it's more relevant for people who are much more stripped down and only trying to sound one way. Yeah. Because no matter how good your guitar is, if you have a very, very versatile sound, it just needs to be able to do, you know, that job overall. But the nuances of it are going to be in the effects, not necessarily in the guitar. Like, again, Animals as Leaders, his guitars are special because he's getting a specific, you know, effect and tone out of his, out of his guitars. Not because his guitar would also be really, really good if he played blues. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, and he is be, bluesier in person than he is on the album, but it's still not, you know, mm-hmm. still ain't John Mayer or, or Ariel yeah. Paulson or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And if you're listening to this, Animals Leaders, they, the uh, the main guy, the guitar player, Tobin Abasi, his guitars are wild looking. Like yeah. they're these headless, like eight string with like this extended like upper horn that kind of like, but it's also like attached to the neck. And they play mostly, you know, tapping with both hands. Um, I don't mostly. I don't, I'm not as well versed in them as I, I I should be. But from what I've seen, majority of their of their guitar work is all tapping. And so, like them having this like really custom, expensive guitar because also the style of what he's playing. You know, the yeah. fret's got to be great. <laughs> you know, the neck's got to be nice and straight. You know, the action's got to be tight. Um, but like you said, like it's you're still running it through effects and that's still bringing out those things. So. Yeah. You know, and, it, I mean, it's, it's, if, if people, let me suggest to anybody who's curious, there's a Rick Beato video uh, interview with Tosin where they're asking like, where he it's how does he play it? Mm-hmm. I think he might be literally the only person on the planet who can play that stuff. I, and it's I, not because it's the most difficult thing, even though it is obviously very challenging and technical, but it's because he invented the technique. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, it's coming. <laughs> it's he, 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 yeah, he's like, he invented it. It's coming from his brain. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's just the most, it's natural to him. And you're, and you have all these guitar players, you know, who could probably technically play it or, but it, it requires such a, like a drastic change of, Thought yeah, they'd have to like go practice normally it. do. He specifically and, talks about that in the video too, uh, nice. about how because um, Rick Beato, who's a fantastic musician, right? Oh yeah, his YouTube channel is amazing. I think if Gold. you watch YouTube at all and you like music, he does these really great breakdowns. It's he's not like a metal guy. He's just a great. He goes out through pop stuff, rock stuff. Like he really like is super talented and knowledgeable. And yeah, it's his videos are always really entertaining. Yeah, he helped me learn music theory, which I did not know, you know, beyond three years ago. But I started listening to his videos and like Adam Neely and a bunch of other Ben Eller, a bunch of like YouTubers, Signals Music Studio. Mm -hmm. And eventually it clicked for me, like what music theory was and how to learn it and how to get better at it. So now I I do know music theory and it's largely because of Rick Beato and and, uh, his videos as well as those other guys. But yeah, so he's interviewing Tosin and he said to Tosin, I tried to do it and it was really, really (laughs) difficult. And Tosin said it's for a specific reason because when you spend all your life alternate picking, his technique, which I'm not going to describe to you guys, definitely go see it. um, It's almost opposite of what you're normally doing, but it has this Mm -hmm. kind of crazy sound to it that is just a new thing he's doing a new thing on guitar and Mm -hmm. um because he's doing a new thing on guitar he is permitted (laughs) per our conversation (laughs) to need a new guitar but if you're just playing you know slayer and at the gates and mashuga yeah (laughs) (laughs) worry about your amp worry about your modelers Worry about knowing how to use those things, like your compressor and your noise gate and all that other stuff. Uh, yeah, the, gu- the, guitar, the guitar is the least important thing in that chain. <laughs> right. Just don't buy a terrible guitar and yeah. upgrade your pickups if you went cheap. But at the end of the day, the guitar is only controlling probably 25% of the sound at best for that being, kind of music. Yeah, that and that's chain. being, that's, I think that's being generous. To I'm be probably honest. being generous. I'm probably yeah. being generous. 
So that, that's awesome. Well, you know, I can just like totally geek out and nerd out with you about guitars and equipment and stuff just forever. But, you know, I can't keep you here all night. <laughs> you're, you're a busy man. You got work to do. I got work to do. So I definitely want to talk to you about your upcoming book, which as of the release of this podcast has just come out with Colin Bunn. Um, and this is with uh, AWA. Yes. And it's an all ages book. Mm-hmm. And which is exciting because I like seeing, you know, I like when people put out people. I like put out all ages books. Cause I'm like, Oh, cool. I, you know, eventually, you know, I can have this around for my kids. <laughs> um, and you know, you know, maybe that'll get them excited. And if it's someone I, you know, I know, you know, that there's extra yeah. little, extra little, uh, icing on the cake for that for me. But bite sized is, you know, I'm not going to describe it. I'm going to let you do it since you know it more intimately, but it looks really cool. The art Thank looks, you. the art looks great. And, uh, I'm, I'm hoping it, it it comes out the gates kicking ass, but yeah, if you want to let us know about bite sized. Yes. So this is definitely for the parents listening to this podcast because it is an all ages book and is, you know, absolutely in my opinion, and a perfect book to read to your kids or to get your kids into reading comics. Um, it's like, you know, gremlins meets batteries, not included kind of a thing and more on the vibe of like a Pixar movie and just me personally as an artist, this is one of the books I'm most proud, probably the book I'm most proud of as of this moment in my entire career. That's awesome. Because, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's the best art I've done in terms of the goal I was trying to set. It's taught me the most about comics. I think it's closest to, you know, the mark and, you know, like when you start a book, you want to get to a certain place with it. And I think this is the, the first book I've done where... When I hit issue four, I didn't look back at issue one and go, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah. There's like little things that um, mm-hmm. that I could look at and, and, you know, obviously you always want to be able to improve, but the overwhelming reaction that I have to the book is, oh man, you know, I'm really happy I did this. I think we did a pretty good job here and I'm proud of the team. And because it is for for younger people, it feels good to do something that could get kids into reading. You know, it, it genuinely feels fantastic to um, to provide that because that's that's how I got into reading. I read a big stack of comics when I was a kid, and I and it wasn't all adult comics until a little later. So I grew up reading like Archie and you know the Berenstain Bears and stuff like that. No, they're not really comics, but it's still comic. you know, it, it, it's, yeah. it's it's close enough. <laughs> close enough, right? And this is this is you know a little this is more closer to like the Archie borderline adve- more of an adventure book than like mm-hmm. super super kitty book. Um I don't think there's anything in it that would scare a 4 or 5 year old, but it's definitely more, you know, 7 8 9 year old. Um Okay. Type again Gremlins is a is a fairly safe. I mean, Gremlins is a little scarier than what we're doing, but batteries not included is right on the mark. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned batteries not included, and it's like one of my all time favorite yeah. movies when I was growing up. And I'm like, I didn't, you know, I, I for some my brain did not put that together. But now that you mentioned it, I'm like, oh wow, yeah. So that, now I'm just like doubly excited awesome. to crack this open because I'm just <laughs> like, I yeah, I. I I have many an afternoon were spent watching that movie. So, uh, this is, de- yeah, this is definitely going to be, uh, be something I pick up and you're working on this with Colin Bunn, who's yes. an amazing writer. Was this something you guys kind of developed together or did like AWA approach you guys with this idea? I'm not sure the whole, I'm not sure the whole like process with AWA, uh, they are a fairly new publisher. And so, I'm not sure, yeah, if they approached you or if you had this idea and you tapped Colin or vice versa or how did that come about? So Axel approached me because uh, he liked my work on, yeah. from Romulus and working on Luke Cage and stuff like that. And so Axel, he approached me. to that's Axel I, Alonso. The, uh, yeah, uh, Axel Alonso, sorry. Um, and he, so he approached me to work with him on an Upshot book. Uh, Upshot okay. is the studio from AWA that he controls. Yeah. And um, iPop is the other side of AWA. AWA is like the overall parent company. Okay. And uh, so, but the, the more like super comic booky stuff, like Resistance and Kari Andrews' book, that's all Upshot, right? 
Mm-hmm. So, uh, can Grendel, Kentucky with Tommy Lee Edwards, that's, you know, that definitely, he's another one, anything he draws, I go out and get, uh, that's a cool book, hotel, cool book. So anyway, um, he approached me to work on something and I told him I'd really like to do something that was all ages and more of a Pixar animation vibe. Cause I haven't gotten to do that in comics yet. And I tell people that I want to do that and they don't believe me because everybody in comics, except for <laughs> Stuart Eminem draws one way, right? Yeah. So, so he said, yeah, he said, I have a book with, uh, you know, Cullen, uh, if you want to take a crack at it. And from there we talked about it and I was able to design all of the, uh, characters, the dog, the, you know, the robots, everything, uh, the general look of the world. And they, they honestly kind of let me run with that part of it. And Cullen had the scripts ready and, and we went, you know, we just went forward. There was not really a back and forth over the story. Uh, there were certain things that I input into the designs that I know Colin piggybacked off of because there were no robots when they asked me to do the book, right? Oh, like they okay. had these, they had some concept art, but we didn't use any of that stuff. And it's not even, um, it's not even in the ballpark of what that stuff looked like. So once I drew the robots, I designed them to have a certain functionality to them. So then when he put the robots in, in like the following stories, uh, they operated according to that functionality. So there was some hand over fist, but it was mostly unsaid in that regard. Uh, but Cullen's, I think he's a fantastic writer. I think um, his horror stuff is really, really great. And even in this story, even though it is a younger, you know, all ages kind of a book, you can tell that that horror writer is in there with the way the suspense is set up. Obviously, it doesn't wind up in blood or guts or anything because it's kids. So it winds up in this kind of adventure thing. But if you remember those movies from when you were younger, when you were younger, they were scary. (laughs) Right? Well, yeah. And that's that's a hallmark, though, of like a really good, you know, creator or creative uh, writer where you don't need to have this graphic payoff, you know, if you can ratchet up the tension of something yes. to where, you know, and you, yeah, yeah, where you don't have to get explicit. It's like, okay, you don't have this crazy violent or, or slasher or this, you know, someone getting horribly mutilated or something. You can take that skill and you, you apply it to, to an all ages book. And I think, that kind of separates a lot of these all ages books from each other where it's like you have a writer who's to ins- to put something like that into a book like that you know where you can ratchet up the tension and make it suspenseful like that's huge you're not just like oh here's a kid's he's a fun thing and you know the stakes aren't super high you know and the kids no you're not pushing too far and it's like you know that's not stuff I read when I was a kid. Like, yeah, sure, right. there's the fun stuff. There was like the Archie stuff and like that. But you know, we also watched Batteries Not Included. We also watched, you know, The Goonies. We also watched these things where there was tension. Like, yeah, like Stand by Me. You know, yeah, like exactly. And, and that that took it a little further because there was an actual dead body. Yeah. But that wasn't the scariest part of Stand by Me for me. It was when he was running from the dog in like the junkyard, right? It's yeah, like, exactly, exactly. And it's just a exactly dog that of. didn't do him any harm, but for yeah. a kid being caught in the mysterious junkyard with the scary junkyard dude and the dog with the crazy name. Yeah. That's what this story uh, brings to the table. And, you know, the kids are equally scared of what the robots might be bringing or doing as they are about their parents finding out about the mess that's made you know <laughs> yeah totally so what what's like the synopsis of the book like what's the the thrust of the story okay so the basic story is for this military facility is working on these robots um they're working and the robots are basically well i won't say what they do or what they're for Okay. But the robots have gotten to the point where their AI is so good that they become afraid of the testing that the military mm. is doing on them and they seek to escape. So, uh, and all of the robots that escape aren't good robots, you know? Oh, okay. Right. So, and the, so the robots, and you can see this in the preview, um, they escape the military facility, they disable all of the military equipment, and they wind up under this uh, truck from this uh, truck drive from this trucker and he drives through you know from state to state and they wind up at the house of the family um the wilson family that that is in um that's in our book and 
hijinks ensue from there. You know, they sneak into the kid's house and instead of uh, getting a new, um, what well, 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 my favorite toy was when I was younger was when I got the Batmobile on Christmas, the uh, <laughs> Tim Burton yeah. Batmobile. That was, there have been a lot of great toys, but getting the Batmobile <laughs> with Batman and the Joker was, was the one. But instead of getting a Batmobile, you get a potentially killer robot <laughs> in the toy box. And that's pretty much the premise from there. Awesome. Awesome. I'm, I'm getting a little uh, short circuit vibes too, maybe. Yeah, there's a little short circuit in there. Uh, and you can go to awastudios.net and they have a preview uh, that Nelson just mentioned to, ch- to check out the story to kind of get a primer for it. But, you know, a- again, as we're talking, this book is, you know, the first issue is out. And is this digital only or is it also in shops? It should be in shops. Yeah, it's in shops. Okay. It, it's definitely in shops because I just got my comps. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So, yeah, you know, Hopefully your uh, comic shop was smart <laughs> and, and, they, <laughs> and, and they ordered because, uh, you know, uh, I have I've kind of not to dismiss it at all, but I kind of forget about AWA sometimes because there's a lot of newer publishers that have just mm-hmm. arisen and I've been seeing like Suffer Bite Sized or uh, Erratic, the other book. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this looks awesome. I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh crap, AWA. And AWA, you know, it was, you know, founded by, you know, one of the founders was Axel Alonso, a former editor in chief of Marvel and Co- Marvel Comics, and Bill Jemis, a former executive at Marvel Comics. And it's like, there's a huge pedigree. <laughs> yeah, the, and, and think, they get top tier talent. You know, uh, yeah, again, and, Tommy Lee Edwards, Kari Andrews, um, uh, Diamato Jr. You know what I'm saying? Like. Yeah, and and I you know, and then I remember that they have that cool like creative council thing going on too, where it's like I'm not sure how much that influences the stories that are being told, but you got people like Reginald Hudlin and J. Michael Straczynski and mm-hmm. yeah, J. Michael like, Straczynski does a, does books over there too. Yeah, uh, and, I believe he does the Resistance. So you know, again, top talent, top talent. It's, yeah, it's like it's like crazy, and it's like almost like mind blowing that this is a publisher now, like mm-hmm. the of. Uh, the the deck is stacked so <laughs> so high on this publisher it's crazy so um i'm really excited to read this book uh i can't wait till it comes out it looks like it's just gonna be a ton of fun i'm um, also excited to check out some of the other awa books because it's, it's just like you said it's just top tier talent and it's like as we were kind of talking about like you know sometimes comics can get a little rough <laughs> because you have so much baggage or continuity or pre-existing worlds that you kind of you know for the most part like if you haven't been reading this like you kind of have to like reacclimate yourself with you know awa seems to be putting out some stuff where it's just like no you can just jump right in and, yes and yes. just that is right now every book is that way that you can just pick pick up the issue one see if you dig it and if you do you're just in for a cool story. Uh, they 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 will have a universe overall, and some of the books are attached to a universe forthcoming. But they're not at the point yet where you need to read this book and that book and worry about where it's going and all that other stuff. Everything right now is just kind of a self-contained, awesome story within its own world. That it's the kind of that thing you were talking about before, where you like you got to go through all these trades and you yeah. know figure out what you want to read. If you're in the mood for a horror book, just grab a hotel. You know, if you're in the mood for like a gritty crime thing, just pick up Devil's Highway. And uh, if you, and I know I'm selling right now, like I get it, but that's why I liked working, you know, with with Upshot and AWA. That's why, because I wanted to do that kind of book. So, um, no, I, I as think much it's... as it is me pitching, like at the same yeah. time, it, you know, that I'm, I know if, if you, if people know me, I'm not a huge self promoter because i find it it's just not my character to like go around and be like buy my stuff and <laughs> but this is honestly something that i genuinely feel like if you have young folks and they don't have to be your kids like if you're a teacher you know nephews whatever mm-hmm. nieces if you have young people that you want to get more into reading and you want to sit down and read a book with them i genuinely feel like this is a great opportunity to do so and i i speak as someone who has literally no dog in this race <laughs> uh, you know there there is no uh payment there is no uh pdfs sent to me <laughs> ahead of right. time like um no i think something like awa is incredibly important because you are creating you know top tier level comics with 
huge creators and you're creating these really great entry points just and not just for kids just for anybody Mm -hmm. you know who's interested in reading comics because you know while i kind of feel like you know image was doing that you know it still does that from time to time too but like image has a lot of long-running series now and yeah you know these kind of fiction you know these kind of barriers kind of get put up because you know you can't go into a comic shop and say yeah i want to i want to read batman like, where's the first you know, like where's where do i start <laughs> right and it's like well you know and then it's like well what kind of batman stories do you like or what kind of batman right. stories are you interested in? it come kind of becomes kind of that thing and that's all well and good too i mean there's certainly people who can appreciate that type of that type of uh environment or entry point or whatever but i think for the majority of people you know some something like awa is like critical because you have new stuff that you can just jump right in with a, a huge variety of like genres like you just mentioned if you're interested in horror or crime or all ages or superheroes like we got something for you and you know established you know top level creators are working on it i mean it's like it's kind of a no-brainer so well Nelson, I, you know, I really enjoyed having you on. I appreciate you taking some time and talking about bite size and nerding out with guitars and metal and stuff with me. And hopefully we get to do this again sometime. So before we go, can you let everybody know in internet land where they can find you? Absolutely. Follow- First of all, I have to say this was a total pleasure. As you can tell, I could talk about this stuff all day. Um, and I'm glad for the opportunity to do it here with you. You can find me on uh, Nelson Blake Two on Twitter or Nelson Blake II on Instagram. Uh, Instagram is where I just post my artwork and stuff like that. I honestly don't post that much on Twitter. It's mostly me retweeting books that I have coming out. But uh, I'm pretty active on Instagram, and that's that's the best place to follow my art. Awesome, awesome. And you know, go to your comic shop. Go to Comicsology. You know. Check out Bite Size. Go to awastudios.net. Check out the preview. You know, I went and checked it out before we started recording because I remember that they had the preview up and all that. And you, it, it's gonna sell you. <laughs> so you know, if you have any like doubts about like, oh, I don't know if this book is gonna be right up my alley, like this, this will sell you for sure. So again, Nelson, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me, man. Anytime you want to do this again, let me know. Will do.